This road's hanging right on the pond's edge. One wrong turn and you're in the water. Watch what we had to build to make this road safe. Let's go back to the start and build this from step one. We started by making wooden pegs for the axes. Once we had enough pegs for the axes, we started hammering two pegs at each angle change, following the shape of the pond. All the pegs are in place now, so we take the optical level to help us get the height we need for this retaining wall. First, we take the height of the road and lift it 20 centimeters higher onto the pegs, because this retaining wall needs to sit 20 centimeters above the road. Once everything is marked, we can set the boards up to the marks we made. Then we pull the strings to mark the edge of the wall. Once we figure out the wall's edge, we can start marking where the piles are going to sit. And finally, we can start drilling the piles. We drill them about two meters deep because these piles need to support the retaining wall right on the edge of the pond. Going deeper gives the wall a much stronger base. We also have to be careful here because the water is only about three feet away from where we're operating. That tight space adds another challenge to this build. Drilling next to water is always a bit tricky. The holes fill with water pretty quickly, so we move fast and get the concrete in right after drilling. I'll show the pouring process a little later in the video. Working on a slope makes it harder to keep the drill bit flat and drill straight piles. So before each hole, we flatten the surface with a shovel just to give the drill a stable start. Each hole has to sit exactly on the marks we set earlier. If we miss even by a few centimeters, it becomes much harder to set the wall to match the axis lines. Once the piles are drilled, I'll show you how we pour them and install the rebar cages. Since we have quite a bit of distance to cover, we use the track dumper to move the concrete around. We're mixing everything by hand, so the dumper makes it a lot easier to get the concrete to each pile. These piles already have some water sitting at the bottom, but the concrete will push it out as we pour. That's why we fill each pile right after drilling. If we leave them empty for a few hours, they'd fill completely with water. Right now it's only the bottom that gets wet, and the concrete displaces it without a problem. And once each pile is filled with concrete, we drop the rebar cages into place and line them up with the axis lines. And for the last step, we shape the tops of the piles with a hollow bucket. This bucket has the same diameter as the pile, so it fits perfectly for this job. The bucket gives us a smooth, round finish and lets us set each pile to the exact height we need. And with this step, we finish the piles and let them harden for a few days before we do anything on top of them. 
Now we start installing the main wall reinforcement. We weld rebar spacers to the piles and line them to the axis lines. These spacers set the wall thickness, show the exact edge of the wall, and help keep the cage in the correct position with proper concrete cover. Once we install the spacers on each of the corner piles, we pull a string line and set the rest of them. With all the spacers in place, we can start putting the pre-made rebar cages on top of them. The spacers make this a lot easier. No guessing the concrete cover and no guessing the height. Everything sits at the exact level it should. At every angle change, we cut the rebar ends so the next cage can sit flush and follow the new line. With the last cage in place, we move straight into bending the corner bars. And for that, the dump truck becomes the bending tool since we forgot the actual bender. Each corner has a custom angle, so shaping the bars on site is the only way to get every bend right. Once all the corners are in place, we tie each corner bar with steel wire. Three ties on one cage and three on the other. And then we tack weld the rebar cages to the pile rebars. So everything stays locked in place and can't shift before we install the top spacers. For extra stability, we add diagonal rebars to the piles. These stop the top of the cages from twisting or tilting because we don't want anything moving once the spacers go in. As everything is locked solid, we can install the top spacer on this pile. We set it plumb with the bottom spacer because together they show the exact edge of the wall. And we repeat the same process on all the piles. These piles act as our locking points because once the cages are tied to them, nothing can move. And the last step before the formwork is installing the steel posts for the railing. Putting them in now makes life easier because we can set them in a straight line and lock them in so they won't shift during the pour. With the last steel post in, this stage is finished. You'll notice the tops are uneven, but we'll cut them all to the same height later, once the wall is built and the road is extended. Now we can move on to the formwork. First, we install these plastic caps onto the spacers. They protect our formwork panels from getting damaged and keep them reusable for years. Then we get the steel pot, the brush, and the oil canister. And we coat all the panels with oil. This stops concrete from sticking and leaves a smooth finish on the wall. Once everything is coated, we start setting the panels, beginning with four panels at every angle change. These spots need the most adjustment, and if we get the angles right, everything else goes smoothly. Then we hammer in a few wooden pegs to keep the panels standing. We place them right next to the spacers so the pegs push the panels tight against them. And to lock the panels in place and prevent them from moving, we secure them with thick wire by pulling the pegs together tighter. If we need to bring the panel even closer to the spacer, we twist the wire until it pulls tight against it. In some spots, the ground is too soft, and wooden pegs alone won't hold the panel steady. And to solve that problem, we use threaded rods. We drill through the bottom of the panels and run the rods through, then tighten both pegs together so we don't have to rely only on the ground. This locks the panels in tight, and we don't have to worry about them blowing out during the pour. And with this corner locked in place, we can move on and do the rest of them. Gotta be careful with the formwork on this edge, because one wrong step and you're going into the water.
Once all the corners are in and adjusted, we can start putting in the rest of the panels. And for the small spots where standard panels won't fit, we use custom cut pieces to fill the gaps. And we're left with this last small section at the end of the wall. We set the last board in to close off the end of the wall. We leave it slightly away from the steel post so the concrete doesn't chip off at the edge. Then we make sure it's plumb and screw it to the existing formwork. All the panels are in place and locked. And for the last step in setting up this formwork, we add the extra support pegs so the concrete won't blow the formwork out. It's always better to have more support than not enough. And one more thing before we start the pour, we need to set the finished height of the concrete. And for this task, we bring back the optical level. Since the driveway slopes, we transfer the height at each angle and lift it by 20 centimeters. That way, the final concrete follows the slope evenly. Once we transfer the height onto the formwork, we pull a string line from one end to the other and hammer in the nails along that line. And finally, we can start pouring. For this site, we're mixing the concrete by hand. Water first, then cement. Sand is there too, don't worry, I promise you. We load up the track dumper full of concrete and off we go to fill the formwork. It's quite a distance to haul and this dumper really saved us. With hand mixing, consistency is everything. The water ratio, the cement, and the sand all have to match from batch to batch. If that balance changes, the concrete cures differently, and you even see color changes on the wall once the formwork comes off. We have to stay on pace, concrete doesn't wait, slow down too much and you risk a cold joint, so we keep adding fresh mix to fresh concrete to keep the bond strong. Then we vibrate the concrete. Hand mixed batches trap more air, so this step is even more important than usual. And around the steel posts, we take even more care, since honeycombing is most likely to show up there. Now we can move on to leveling the top. First we find the nails that mark the finished height. Then we spread the concrete evenly until it matches the nail line. And to work around the posts, we use this tiny trowel to help. And for the last step, to get a smooth finish on the concrete, we take a putty knife and gently glide along the top to remove all the tiny marks. And with that, the pouring is complete. We'll leave it for a few days before removing the formwork and continuing with the rest of the work on the wall and the driveway. Time to pull the formwork off and see how it turned out. Panels came off easily since we oiled them up. And the wall turned out sweet. Now we can move on to expanding this road. Before we backfill, we're installing EPS 100 along the wall. It acts as a protective buffer, reduces soil pressure, and protects the concrete from frost movement. We're installing 50 centimeter high EPS sheets for now, but only applying glue halfway. Once we expand the road to the wall, we'll cut the sheets to the final road height. And this way we avoid glue marks on the exposed part. Then we bring in pure sand for the bottom layer. The sand acts as drainage. It stops water from sitting under the driveway. It also helps prevent frost movement in winter.
and it evens out the base so the next layers sit flat. And finally, we can bring in the sub-base material for the finished driveway. Since this is a countryside road, we want it strong, but we also want it to look natural. A well-compacted sub-base is perfect for that. It drains well, it carries the load, and it becomes a solid finished surface without needing anything extra on top. You might have noticed this small trench we left next to the wall. We're filling it with sand for extra protection. Sand allows water to drain down instead of pressing against the concrete. It also reduces frost pressure in winter, and it stops wet soil from pushing directly on the wall. Before we get to compaction, we need to take care of these steel railing posts. First we mark the height we want for each railing post at every angle change, because as you remember this wall has a slight slope. Then we cut a tiny notch at the marks with the grinder. And we hook the string from one end to the other. This lets us mark the rest of the railing posts at the correct height. Now that everything is marked, we can start cutting each post down to the perfect height. All the posts are now cut perfectly to one height. They're ready for the top rail to go in, but that comes later. Right now we need to compact this driveway with this compactor. One pass tightens the surface and shows us where the dips are. Normally you'd compact in thinner layers for best results, but since we'll be extending the driveway to the other side later, this section will settle through the winter and will fix any deformations afterward. Once it's all compacted, we bring in more sub-base material to fill up all the uneven spots. Then we spread the material out evenly. This levels out the surface and fills every dip. And once that's done, we'll compact it again. Then we cut off the EPS that's sticking out. A handsaw does the job. Just cut along the driveway height. And with these steps, the road is now safely secured from the pond. All that's left is installing the top railing, and then we'll move on to building the concrete paths. But I'll show you all of that in the next episode. The railing is in now, the wall is fully finished. And this path will go all the way around the pond. So make sure to subscribe so you don't miss it. And trust me, what we've got planned for the other side of the road might surprise you.